Extrapolating from all the best radiometric dating methods available, scientists estimate that the Earth was formed as a gravitational concretion of cosmic dust and rocks orbiting a newly formed Sun roughly 4.6 billion years ago, that the entire solar system formed as a spinning cloud of debris. As parts of it began to clump together, there was a point where resulting planetoids and any remaining comets and meteors were crashing into each other and clearing out space, until most of the lesser bodies had coalesced into actual planets. And scientists are now convinced that our planet was once struck by another world the size of Mars, and that the ejecta from the resulting impact produced our moon. This most significant of all impacts from space effectively marks the birth of the Earth. Everything in this world, from metal and other minerals to the gases in our atmosphere, the water in our oceans, and even the amino acids that make up life, all rain down from space. And we know that because it's still happening, although fortunately on a much reduced scale. For example, a 4.5 billion year old meteorite fell to Australia in 1969 and was found to contain 80 amino acids among other unidentified molecules of extreme complexity. The environment of the early Earth was very different than it is today. All the lead we have now was once uranium, so indications are that our world was much warmer and more radioactive. The crust was thin with volcanic activity everywhere. The atmosphere was poisonous, almost entirely carbon dioxide with no free oxygen, and the oceans were an as yet unsalted, unsettled broth of churning chemicals boiling over many geothermal vents. Yet, the earliest evidence of life appears surprisingly quickly, with the oldest microfossils yet found dating back as far as 3.77 billion years old. These are archaea, similar to bacteria, but they're extremophiles, capable of surviving in temperatures and conditions that would destroy any other organism. Viruses are not organisms. They're not considered to be alive, even though they can be killed, but they're very similar to living things and may even be an offshoot of what scientists call protobionts, replicative autocatalytic precursors of actual life. Now, some viruses have DNA, while others only have RNA. And this implies that RNA came first, which makes sense considering that RNA can be produced spontaneously in the right chemical environments and RNA builds DNA. Everything on this planet that is unambiguously alive has DNA. Notable features of biochemistry are that life will replicate and proliferate, catalyze and metabolize, and profoundly affect the surrounding environment. These pioneer organisms were anaerobic. They didn't need oxygen to survive. And we still have some bacteria like that today, hiding out in poisonous chambers in remote parts of the world. Some of these anaerobic organisms, like cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, use photosynthesis to get their energy from sunlight, and they produce oxygen as a waste product, just like plants do. In fact, plants do this only because they've incorporated blue-green algae into each of their cells. Cyanobacteria also tend to build up layers of sediment into communal buildings called stromatolites. While a few of these still exist today, these stromatolites are also among the oldest fossils at 3.5 billion years old. So we once had vast colonies of microbes cranking out oxygen constantly in the shallow waters all over the world for billions of years. The pollutant they produced was first absorbed into the oceans, then rusted all of the iron exposed to the air, and eventually turned the sky blue. The air you're breathing likely began as bacterial waste. Oxygen is also highly reactive, which makes it useful, so other organisms eventually adapted to exploit this new energy source, especially when they advanced to multicellular forms. So while algae and plants were both adding oxygen to the atmosphere, many of the earliest animals took carbon dioxide out of the air by absorbing it into the construct of their shells. So most of the CO2 that used to heat our greenhouse is now trapped in fossil fuels which we are now foolishly releasing at industrial levels far beyond what microbes could produce. While cutting down the trees that used to produce the oxygen that we and our cars both breathe. Do you see where this is going? We exhale carbon dioxide faster than the few remaining plants can use it, but our cars exhaust carbon monoxide, which is poisonous to everything alive. Is the end result of this not obvious enough yet? Apparently not to some people. Getting back to bacteria, they and the even more ancient archaea are both prokaryotes, whereas all multicellular organisms are eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have much larger and more complex cells. They're almost a cell within a cell because their DNA is contained within a nucleus. 
Every eukaryote cell has a nucleus, at least initially, even our red blood cells, which lose their nucleus after they're formed because it, they carry more oxygen that way. Eukaryotic cells also have a few organelles. Some of these may have evolved internally, or they can also be adapted from captured smaller cells through endosymbiosis. For example, most eukaryote cells have mitochondria, which were once a form of bacteria that were apparently enveloped and enslaved billions of years ago by some of the first eukaryotes. Mitochondria have their own DNA and they reproduce independently with the cell, but also produce energy for the cell in a symbiotic relationship, as they have apparently done since the dawn of eukarya. The earliest unambiguously eukaryote microfossils are more than two billion years old, but still more than a billion years younger than archaea. The purpose of this video is to give a lesson in cladistics, a monophyletic system of classification, meaning that each of the categories, or clades, contains all the descendants of that clade, like a set of Russian Matryoshka dolls. In the old ranks of Linnaean taxonomy, a population might be considered dinosaurs, for example, if they bear the suite of traits for that group. But Linnaean classification is paraphyletic because it excludes the next descendant group, birds. The new system is phylogenetic, meaning that it is based on an organism's evident ancestry. You can't grow out of your ancestry. You'll always be a modified version of whatever your ancestors were. You may become more than your grandparents were, but you'll always belong to every clade that they did, and so will all of your descendants, even if they start new clades for themselves. And consequently, birds did not stop being dinosaurs when they became birds. In a monophyletic system, birds are still dinosaurs. As we explained in the last video, eukaryotes may have derived from prokaryotes by a number of different processes, including endosymbiosis and especially horizontal gene transfer. But neither of these are evolutionary mechanisms. Evolution is defined as descent with inherent genetic modification. But neither of these provide a clear ancestor-descendant relationship, being different lineages of largely unrelated organisms being mixed together in confusing ways. So cladists could not fairly say that we evolved from bacteria, because other processes dominate. Thus, the buck stops here. The most basic clade of the systematic classification of life are the three domains of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, which could also be divided into two groups of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Every living thing on this planet is one or the other. So the question is, regardless whether you accept evolution or not, will you at least accept and admit that since your cells have DNA inside a nucleus with membrane-bound organelles, that you are by definition a eukaryote.